Welcome to the Shepherd's Pie, a slice of hope to raise faithful kids, where we focus on topics that impact young people today. I'm Antony Barone Kolenk. I'm a father of five who served in the Air Force for 21 years. I'm now a law professor and a columnist for Practical Homeschooling Magazine. I'm also the author of The Harwood Mysteries, an inspirational medieval fiction series for kids aged 10 and up. Here on The Shepherd's Pie, we want to inform, inspire, and help you to raise happy, healthy, faithful kids, whether you're a grandparent, an aunt or uncle, a pastor, anyone. In today's episode, I speak with author M.H. Elric about her fantasy series, The Daughters of Tamneray and about how we can help our kids find God's purpose for their lives. And my guest reviewer, Carrie Schmidt, reviews the teen novel Fade to White by Tara K. Ross. Many of us are familiar with Rick Warren's book, 40 Days of Purpose, even more, our kids need to find God's purpose for their lives. And in our interview segment today, middle school teacher and author M.H. Elric speaks with me about how we can help kids and teens find God's purpose in their lives by encouraging the gifts that they're given. Today I'm speaking with M.H. Elric, a Christian author with a fantasy series called The Daughters of Tamneray. She's worked with kids throughout her life in youth ministry and is now a middle school teacher at a private Christian school. Her fiction short stories have been released in several publications, including The Right Word, Orpheus, and Where Giants Fall. And her Christian fantasy series currently has two novels, the most recent one released in February of 2022. She lives in California with her husband. M.H., welcome to the show. Hello. Thank you for having me. So this is pretty neat. You write fantasy. Were you always uh, a writer growing up, or is this something you came to more as an adult? Yeah, actually, I've always been a writer. My mom told me that even at three years old, I used to write from magazines and then I think that just like a lot of kids in school, I made those construction paper books. And that really started my writer's journey. Um, as silly as that sounds, it's kind of like what started in childhood, that passion grew. And then when I was in fourth grade, our church went through the 40 days of purpose. The Sunday school teacher asked, what is one talent you could use for God's glory? And I automatically thought of writing. And so from that point on, I've been trying to use that talent of writing to honor God and um, just been writing for him. Of course, I didn't really finish a book until my late 20s, but, you know, that's all part of the writing process. Absolutely. Um, now, your fiction short stories, are these typically fantasy stories, or, or what kinds of fiction have you been writing prior to the series? They are primarily fantasy. For the most part, most of my passions have always been for fantasy. I grew up reading Lewis and Tolkien, and my parents bringing me to all the fantasy stuff, so that's very much my passion and more what I prefer to write and read. All right, so this series, The Daughters of Tamneray, tell us a little bit about it. Why did, why did you name it that, for one? I call it The Daughters of Tamneray because it's a generational story. So I start out with Atanya, who is my main character in Atanya's Worth and Atanya's Calling, and her discovery of her identity in Christ, as well as her calling um, to serve God with her powers. Um, and then ultimately her destiny, which is going to be the title of my third book. Then I plan to write more on her daughter, Lavana, in the future, and then maybe even go back in time and write about her mother, Tala. So my idea behind the series was that this would be about the daughters that live in Tamnaray, my made up world and continent, and their adventures and what they, um, their journey of faith throughout the series with fantasy. Usually with fantasy, we do see it set in uh, somewhere fantastical. 
Uh, and, and oftentimes it's interesting when I talk to Christian fantasy authors because they have to try to bring out the spiritual themes that they would like in different ways because we're usually not dealing with our own world. How does faith and Jesus and the Bible fit into your particular series? Well, I'm a lot more like Lewis that I have a God character. So I have Melchizedek, who is my Jesus character. I have the name Deo, which is for like God the Father. And then I also have what's called a mark, which is my way of saying that that's the Holy Spirit being marked on you and you believe in Jesus and Melchizedek. And I have all those elements in order to symbolically represent God and your relationship with God. And I'm also going to incorporate, especially with the Tanya's Destiny, talking more about the Bible and his word and how important that is. My goal in writing these fantasy series is never to become preachy. It's more to show real people going through faith journeys, but also going on adventures with fantasies, and, you know, dragons and werewolves and all these things. But to me, those are only backgrounds for the real story. You know, they're like parables that Jesus tells. Tell us a little bit about like what's the basic plot or, or character development that is going on with your characters in that series. Yeah, Atonia is given a special ability directly from God, and that ability is something that she never wanted. She's very much a reluctant heroine. And at, throughout the series, she's learning to embrace and trust what God asked her to do and what God has called her to do, uh, even against her own desires and her own goals for herself. Kind of embracing that God has a higher purpose that sometimes we can't understand, but if we trust him, he will ultimately work things for our good. And I think that's where Atanya has it throughout the series. You know, there's romance in there, so it's also dealing with relationships and dealing with, okay, how does my calling impact my romantic relationship? How does my calling impact my friendship or even my relationship with my parents? Like, are they supportive of what I want to do? Are they, do they go against what I want to do for God? You know, these are all questions I feel like my characters wrestle with, especially in these books. Now you've worked a lot with kids throughout your life. You know, are you struggling with some of those same issues that your main character is uh, dealing with? Yeah, I think that me personally, I struggled with my own calling and purpose in God. You know, I've always been a writer and wanted to write, but I felt like God was saying, I didn't just give you writing as a talent, I gave you teaching as well. And I want you to use both for my glory. And so I am very much like a Tanya in the sense that it was hard for me to accept that teaching is also something God wanted for me to do. And I think a lot of kids wrestle with that too. They have these dreams or aspirations, a lot of them to be like a professional baseball player, professional soccer star. And you and I both know that the likelihood of them being professional is extremely slim. And you don't want to like crush their dreams, but you want them to be open to what God has for them and what where God calls them. And that's mainly what I focus on is trying to cultivate their skills, not just in athleticism, but also in speaking or, you know, maybe it's engineering or, you know, these other things and helping them recognize the talents that God has given them so that they can use those for whatever he's called them to do which sometimes might not be being a professional baseball player. That's not saying that it can't come true. It's just saying that we need to be open to what God has to tell us and what he wants for our lives. Yeah, that's so true. And I guess the more important nugget under all of this is that there actually is some sort of purpose for each of our lives. And that might not be as apparent to some of our youth today. How does your main character sort of deal with this idea? Does she uh, resist the idea that she even has a purpose? Yeah, she definitely does resist it. She resists this idea that God has called her to do something dangerous, you know, um, that God has called her to be uh, this person in this light. You know, when you get that call, it's not always that we all say, yes, let's go. I think a lot of us are very reluctant to obey what God has for us in his voice. And I think that my character struggles with that. 
And I also feel like, you know, children today struggle with that, is that sometimes they are not sure what God wants for them or that they even have purpose or worth. And it's oftentimes the words of scripture and God intervening that can make the difference in their lives. And what have you found as you've gone through some of these same struggles has been helpful for you to recognize? Um, was there something for you that really crystallized it that, you know, yeah, God actually does have ideas for me? Yeah, what helped me was actually joining Bible study fellowship and also reading about the Holy Spirit. I felt like both those things together really helped me understand how God calls people, how he moves, and how his word will guide us, even when it feels like there is nothing, you know. When we are at our worst, I think that God gives us um, his scripture, his Holy Spirit prayer, the encouragement of other believers to ultimately guide us back onto his path. I personally, you know, strayed from his path in the sense that I went and tried to do my own thing for a long time, but I felt like God kind of navigated me back and showed me that I am where I'm supposed to be. And he, you know, he opens doors, like he opened the door to get the job I have now. I was not expecting it. It was totally unexpected. You know, I think that's how God works is he just opens doors. And if you feel like you're being blocked in every way, you might want to stop and pray and say, ask God, God, why is this happening? And he might be showing you something through that. Yeah, such great advice. But when you're talking to kids, have you found, you know, very practical ways to relate to youth so that they can understand that, you know what, you know, you do, you do have a purpose, you do have a calling, and this is how you can try to get in touch with that? The most practical way I've found is by cultivating their talents, which is to encourage them. When you see as a youth leader or a teacher or a parent, you see something your child is good at and you just overflow and give them opportunities to exhibit that gift and talent and honor it. And something my principal does at my school very well is honor the talents of all the children. So if they win an award at the fair, if they win um, a championship in football, if they win robotics, if they do well in a creative writing festival or an art festival, I think it's good that we encourage our children and encourage them to see, look, this is a talent God gave you and other people are recognizing it, not just, you know, mom and dad. And I think so personally, I think that encouraging children to go and try new things, to see what they're good at, to compete in different ways, and then honoring them is ultimately helping them in a practical way to recognize these are the talents God has given me and how can I use them to honor him. So turning back to your your main character, Tanya, it sounds like you sort of bring her on this journey. How does she ultimately figure out that this is, in fact, a calling from God that she needs to embrace? I chose to do it where God appears to her in dreams, um, like in the Bible, and tells her, hey, this is what I've called you to do. I want you to embrace it and go through. So personally, I enjoyed the dream aspect, and that's how I chose to do it. The main reason I did that is because I have very vivid dreams. Now, I've never had a a God come down in a dream and tell me anything. But at the same time, I do believe it's possible for people. Um, And so I think I just went on that possibility with her and um, went from there. You know, that would make it a lot simpler for me. I think if if God could just come to me in a dream and in a way that would make it very clear that this is the voice of God, I suppose that would make it a little easier for us. In fact, I wonder why is she even resisting at that point if, uh, if she knows that God is calling her to this in this dream? You know, I think that's a great question. And my answer can be found in scripture. I mean, how many times did someone in scripture have God call them to do something? And they're like, no, I mean, think about Moses in the burning bush. He saw God in the burning bush. And God's like, you need to go tell Pharaoh that I, to let my people go. And Moses goes, I, I'm a stammerer. I can't go. I can't do this. So despite these direct encounters with God, he resisted. And I think that's a very thematic thing that happens in the Bible. And so to me, it is believable that even though God appeared to her in a dream, she still resisted that idea because people in the Bible did the same thing when God showed up. 
Yeah, I guess you're right. There's probably no limit to our stubbornness <laughs> when it comes to <laughs> resisting uh, what God wants us to do, especially if it's not at the top of our own list. But going back to what you were saying earlier with encouraging and honoring kids' skills, it seems like usually if we're good at something, we enjoy doing it. And if if we're enjoying doing what we're good at and God is the one who's given us that skill, it seems like logically we would think we would want to embrace that skill because it makes us feel good too because we're we're succeeding at it. Um, you know, what what has been your experience dealing with kids uh, with that aspect? You know, I think it's easy for kids to embrace what they enjoy doing. So if it's sports or things that are more close to their heart, it's a lot easier to embrace versus, you know, I am an English teacher and a lot of the kids do not enjoy reading or writing or speaking, you know, which are skills I teach. At the same time, I will tell you that I see many children with these skills and talents. And what I have done is encourage them and help get also contact their parents and get their parents on board so that you can nurture these things. I've had uh, several reluctant students uh, who competed in speech meet, which is the equivalent of oral language or a speech competition. And I told uh, this particular student, I told him, I said, look, I know you're into sports and that's what you want to do, but I feel like God's given you a talent of speaking and I really feel like you should cultivate that talent. And who knows, maybe if you become a famous football player, you can go and speak just like all those athletes we know, like Derek Carr and other Christian athletes who are good speakers in addition to football players who use their platform to reach others for Christ. And so sometimes I feel like that's the best way to encourage children is to kind of address it and try and help them to see and realize that, oh, it's not just, oh, this is embarrassing, which is the biggest thing for middle school and teenagers is like, oh, this is embarrassing. It's not about that. It's about, you know, God gave you this talent and let's honor him with it. And you never know where he's going to take you with it. That's kind of how I approach it as a teacher. I just try to be extremely encouraging and think of out of the way boxes to get kids motivated to do something that they may not like doing all the time. Yeah, you're speaking my language now because as an author of books for teens, we want them to want to read our books, but it seems like there are a lot of challenges to getting kids to read today. What do you see as sort of the biggest impediments to getting kids interested in reading and especially reading higher quality or better fiction rather than they might find uh, in some places? I think there's a couple ways to cultivate that. One is to embrace different ways of seeing reading. And what I mean by that is an audiobook is still reading. A comic book is still reading. A magazine about sports is still reading. That is how I've encouraged some of my reluctant readers. I tell them, well, what are you interested in? Well, I'm interested in horses. Okay, go find every nonfiction book you could find about horses and read about horses. That's reading. Whatever you enjoy reading, picking up. So that's the first way I try to cultivate a love of reading. The second way is by setting an example. And I think a lot of parents do not read or do not read to their children, or do not um, cultivate that themselves, and then sit there and go, why doesn't my child like reading? Well, do you read? Do you talk about the books you're reading? And what I'll find often is, well, no. Well, okay, your child's not going to want to read because they don't see mom and dad doing it, so they think reading is a waste of time. So I think embracing that wide variety of reading in different ways, I think helps make a lot more people want to read. What about reading on social media, reading Facebook, or what about watching TikTok videos? Are those things that are beneficial to developing the kids' skills? Or are you able to sort of turn those in a positive direction? To be honest, I tend to think of social media as extremely negative for children. And the reason why is because of the fact there are so many bad examples out there and a lot of the kids will follow TikTok trends or they will experience bullying or stalking or things like that. So it's very difficult for me to consider social media in a positive light for children. What I see as a middle school teacher and someone that's been doing it a while is that 
overall, the kids on social media are a lot less likely to pick up a book and read. They're a lot less likely to do their homework. They're a lot less motivated to be in school and they're a lot more likely to cause problems because they're following some TikTok trend, which you might have heard of the one that like you go and steal things from the schools. This is what I see. So I think you have to be a very discerning parent and whether you're going to let your child use social media until they're old enough and mature enough to be able to handle it. You'd want there to be some positive things, but you're right. There's so many um, negative things. And yet this is what kids are faced with. As as we start heading towards the end here, do you have any uh, other thoughts on how we can help kids find their purpose? I honestly think that going through like a kid's version of 40 Days of Purpose is a great idea because that's what I did, you know, as a child. And then as an adult, I kind of read parts of his book. And I feel like going through that book personally, even if you went through it with your child, really helps them clarify what their ultimate purpose here on earth is and then how we can identify things that they're good at. I think another thing is to have them taking like personality quizzes or spiritual gift quizzes and things like that, that show, hey, these are talents that you have, and these are things that you can cultivate for God. So those were things that I would personally do to help my child grow his or her talents and find his or her purpose in um, serving God and honoring him. Uh, So if folks are interested in getting a hold of your books or just even want to learn a little bit more about you as an author or person, uh, where would you like them to go? I would recommend my website, mhelrich.com, E-L-R-I-C-H, or I would recommend following me on Instagram, mhelrichbooks. In both places, I post a lot about my books and writing and all those things, so they could check out those places. Wonderful. Well, MH, thank you so much for being on the show, talking about, I think, a pretty important topic uh, for our kids today. Uh, It's been a pleasure having you on. Uh, Thank you so much. Today I have back with me Carrie Schmidt, the founder of readingismysuperpower.org. She's a book reviewer, an avid reader. She even does publicity tours for books with her Just Read Publicity Tours. Lives in Georgia with her husband, Eric. Carrie, welcome back to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Always a pleasure to be here. Now you've brought me uh, Fade to White by Tara K. Ross, a book for high schoolers, I understand. Uh, Tell us a little bit about that book. So Fade to White is Tara's debut novel, and it does not read like a debut novel. It's very well written, very well put together and thought out. Thea is a high schooler who struggles with anxiety. She's always struggled with it to a point, and then some events happen that sort of trigger it to become something that's unmanageable, really, for her. She resorts to some self-harm to really deflect the anxiety, and by that I mean she pulls her hair out, so it's nothing life-threatening, but it is self-harming. Her grandmother, who she was very close to and who was really the source of Christianity and faith in her life, has recently passed away. Her parents' marriage is struggling as her father is just not able to process his mother's death. And then a local teenager that goes to her school commits suicide, and suddenly Thea's anxiety just skyrockets. She has what are dubbed whiteouts, where she's really feeling somebody else's pain empathetically, but it's affecting her anxiety as well. So a lot of heavy themes in this book. Uh, yeah. the, the self-harm, I mean, yeah, so there's some serious things you're talking about here. How okay. is the author able to handle some of the self-harms? I know this is something that we worry about with our teenagers today. It's a very authentic look at what teenagers are facing right now. The pressures, the temptations, the anxiety, again, all the things that are just piling on them and how they're dealing with it. And different characters in the book are dealing with things in different ways. She does address it. She does address the importance of getting help, of being open and honest with the people in your life that you can trust about what's going on with you. But at the same time, it's a, it's a book with heavy themes, but it's not what I would call a heavy book. It's very witty in times. It's written in first person. So you get in the head of this snarky teenager who, you know, has these great one-liners and very kind of self-deprecating on herself. So you kind of feel like a teenager again when you're reading it and all those feelings and, and everything. 
Now, is the book just about how this teenager is dealing with her anxiety? Or is there some other, you know, theme moving, some mystery to solve or some big event going on? There's not really any big mystery to solve. There is a theme of her advancing from kind of one stage of anxiety to the next, of getting help. There's this young man that she meets who is new to the area. Uh, His name is Kai, and he's another Christian. So he's really the source of a lot of the hope that this novel shines out toward people who may not go to church, teenagers who may not be familiar with the gospel or with the Bible or anything else, but are still struggling with all these things that Thea is struggling with. The author handles all of this. She deals with it all very tactfully and with a lot of grace and with some humor and a lot of hope. And so the the theme of Christianity and faith definitely is uh, more explicit in this book. It's a little obvious. It's, It's sort of a cross between subtle and overt, if that makes any sense. It's not in there in your face right away. Um, It's something that you subtly build toward as the novel progresses. It's a very subtle getting to know her, understanding what she's going through, and then at the time when she most needs to hear it, really giving her that hope of faith. Okay. And you know that, I mean, obviously we we have an ecumenical audience here. Uh, Christians of any denomination would feel uh, comfortable with the presentation of Christianity here? Yes, I believe so. It's definitely not leaning toward any particular denomination or background. It sounds like a serious book. Uh, Your recommendation on ages for this one? High schoolers, mature high schoolers who um, are able to kind of handle some of the themes, um, who are ready for those themes. And I think every parent knows their kids. So, you know, if your teenager is exposed to a lot of these situations, which in their public school or any school, really, at this stage, they, they are. So it's an authentic look, a realistic look, but a very hopeful look. You can get through it and that there are people who care and that God is one of them. All right. Thanks so much, Carrie. So Fade to White by Tara K. Ross. Appreciate your time and for coming back on the show. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. That's all the time we have for the show today. We spoke with M.H. Elric about finding God's purpose for our kids' lives, and Carrie Schmidt reviewed Tara K. Ross's teen novel, Fade to White. Again, this is Anthony Barone Kolank, and this has been The Shepherd's Pie. If any of you listening today have a question for me or a topic you'd like to have us cover on the show, please drop me a line on my website at antonykolank.com. That's A-N-T-O-N-Y-K-O-L-E-N-C dot com. Also, if you visit my website, you can learn more about my historical fiction series for kids, The Hardwood Mysteries. I'll end, as always, with my wife's favorite scripture quote from Romans 8, 28. We know that all things work for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. May the Lord bless and keep you this week.